Mark Lipovetsky. Um, he has uh, received his PhD in 1989 and his Doctor of Philology in 1996 from Ural State University. He is a professor of Russian Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, the author of eight books, 15 co-edited volumes, and more than 100 articles on various aspects of Russian literature and culture of the 20th and 21st centuries. His paper today is titled, The Logic of a Regional Cultural Revolution, Sverdlovsk in the Perestroika Period, and Alexei Ivanov's Yoburg. <coughs> Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, in my paper, I will focus on a cultural surge explosion, <clears throat> or even cultural revolution, that had happened in Sverdlovsk, uh, Ekaterinburg, since 1991, during perestroika and early post-Soviet years, and whose echo still keeps defining a cultural status of this city. For the analysis of this phenomenon, I'll use a source book uh, as a source book. Uh, a recent volume, your book, by the same author about Bradley just spoke by Alexei Ivanov and uh, why does it look like that? Okay, um, I'm sorry. And uh, of course, Bradley's paper saves me from from the lengthy uh, introduction here. Um, as as Bradley mentioned, Ivanov has a cycle actually of non-fictional books uh, about the Urals, and these books uh, all aim to conceptualize the Ural specificity as a cultural and historically distinguished region of Russia. Yoburg uh, belongs to this cycle, um, and uh, this volume consists of 100 non-fictional stories about prominent cultural, political, and criminal figures acting in Yekaterinburg from the late 80s to 2000s, as well as about more spectacular uh, episodes of the political struggle, mafia wars, and cultural scandals. Although Ivanov lives permanently in Pirm, he has spent his university years in Sverdlovsk, Ekaterinburg, and knows it quite well. Yoburg, in Ivanov's interpretation, is the name of the city in transition between the Soviet Sverdlovsk and wealthy post-Soviet Ekaterinburg. Yet he suggests that it was Yoburg of Perestroika and the early 90s that has emerged as a true capital of the Garnazovatskaya Civilizatsiya. Although Ivanov treats cultural phenomena along with other aspects of the city's turbulent unofficial history, I would like to argue that the Sverdlov's cultural revolution has reshaped the regional identity, not as a narrow geographical, but as an all-Russian, rather universally post-Soviet phenomenon, and by this means has solidified the symbolic centrality of Yoburg as the capital of the Urals. Sverdlovsk uh, before the perestroika was not a cultural desert, as one might imagine, by, uh, but its cultural life was not much different from that in other Russian cities of a similar size, about one million population, and same administrative status, a center of the large industrial oblast. It had two literary journals, Ural and Uralsky Slidapit, the latter was the sole Soviet journal specializing in science fiction, large writers, artists, and composers' unions, five theaters, uh, as well as the Philharmonic Concert Hall, a respected conservatory, and the Urals Folk Chorus. Uh, Sverdlovs housed a dozen of colleges and universities, among which the largest were Ural Polytechnic Institute, uh, Ural State University, and the School of Mines. Um, Sverdlovsk uh, uh, cultural self-imagining, as, as any narrative of this kind, was fragmented and uh, included several uh, discourses of different origin, uh, legends about the city's founder, Statishev and Degenin, stories about Demidov, mostly Demidov and uh, his ascendants, some stories about Stroganovs, um, nostalgic narratives of the Ural's millionaires, mainly informed by Mamin Sibiriak's novels, um, hushed memory of the execution of the royal family in 1918, uh, Soviet narratives of Ural the Ural's as the bearing region of the state, uh, which were supported and at the same time debated by semi-official counter-narrative of various te technogenic catastrophes and horrible ecology. Uh, however, the central role in the imagined uh, mythology of the Urals and Sverdlovsk played uh, Pavel Petrovich Bajov's tales, skazy, glorifying the craft 
of local stone carvers. This case uh, formed exactly the, this symbolic core around which all these discourses were grouping. Uh, first published in 1939 as a collection uh, of the Euro's uh, workers' folklore about the stone carvers and their interactions with class enemies and fantastic spirit, spirits at the background of the Euro's of the 18th, uh, early 19th century. Bajov tales, in fact, uh, were an individual author's mythology of the region. This was a pure case of fake lore. Uh, this mythology in the 40s, 50s had been incorporated into the discourse of Soviet nationalism as the glorification of Mother Russia, gladly sharing its riches with the true men of labor. A closer analysis, however, reveals in Bajov's tales quite an opposite mythology. Motifs of the uncanny dominating in, the, in his skazi, in my interpretation, are associated with the repressed memories of the indigenous uh, cultures predating Russia's colonization of the Urals in the 17th century. Instead of the sense of people's kinship with their native land, Bajov highlights their alienation from it. This uncanny groundlessness manifests itself through images of fantastic mountain spirits. Typically fearsome, they sometimes may appear as benevolent donors, yet their, their unpredictable and capricious character rules out any idea of control over nature as ridiculously irrelevant. This mythology of the Urals indeed has shaped the core of the regional cultural identity. Curiously, Bajov's tales are not universally known across the Urals, but are perceived by people living there as the region's ancient folklore, despite the fact that they, they were created in the 1930s. Sirdos population in the 20th century absorbed at least three waves of large-scale migrations. The first one happened in the 30s, when the city had become one of the centers of industrialization and construction of such giants of five-year plans as Uralmash or Elmash had been absorbing hundreds of thousands of decolocized peasants, engineers, technicians, and their families. During the war times, Sverdlovsk appraised as one of the major hubs for evacuation, and several major plants and universities from the European part of the USSR had moved here. A large number of intelligentsia members from Moscow and Leningrad stayed in Sverdlovsk during the war, leaving behind a host of students and followers. Finally, uh, Sverdlovsk, you've seen this map already, uh, played a significant role in the geography of uh, Gulag, and you can see that Sverdlovsk is surrounded by a very thick layer of uh, various uh, concentration camps. Uh, surrounded by concentration camps and housing, several sharashkas, including the one where the famous tank T-34 was designed, Sverdlovsk was not included in the short list of cities banned for former inmates residents. And therefore, a large number of victims of the Great Terror, after their release, remained living in Sverdlovsk, along with many professional criminals. The former prisoners of the infamous 58th article of the Soviet Penal Code and their family members are in many ways responsible for the predominantly anti-Stalinist and general latent anti-Soviet cultural atmosphere in Sverdlovsk of the 60s and 80s, from 60s to the 80s. This multi-layered pie of newcomers likens Sverdlovsk with such large metropolis as Moscow and Leningrad. However, the lack of a prominent cultural tradition contributed to a peculiar sense of alienation from the place about which I started speaking, which suggests a parallel with Creole communities. Several technogenic catastrophes, such as the 1979 fire at the secret lab developing formally banned biological weapons, and an ensuing epidemics of anthrax, officially coded as cow's foot and mouth disease, Yashur, along with the high level of pollution, enhanced this sense of alienation. Uh, military plants and research institutes had been dominating Sverdlovsk economy since the 1940s. This explains why the city remained closed for most of uh, foreigners, except for visitors from the select communist bloc countries until perestroika. It also explains a high rate of scientific and technological intelligence within its population. Historically, this was a cultural strata that has played a decisive role in the formation of the post-Stalinist liberalism. Hence, a general openness of the city population to the perestroika triggered political discussions and democratic reforms. It was Sverdlovsk where the first open political debate club was established in 1988 as a model for many other analogous clubs across the USSR. 
Along with the fact that Yeltsin for more than a decade served as the head of the regional party organization, dem democratic predilections turned Sverdlovsky into a flagship of the anti-communist movement and the most enthusiastic supporter of Yeltsin during his struggle with Gorbachev, or rather with central Moscow-based authorities. Illuminatingly, during the March 1991 referendum for or against the preservation of the USSR, the Sverdlovsk region was the only subject of Russian Federation where the vote for the preservation of the Union did not reach the mark of 50%, a result similar to Baltic national republics. During the coup d'etat of August 1991, Sverdlovsk had been prepared to house Yeltsin's government in case of his ousting from Moscow. Yet neither the Creole-like alienation from the area nor the confrontation with Moscow uh, domination taken separately can explain uh, the cultural and intellectual surge in the perestroika period. Sverdlovsk, one of the participants of this uh, process, uh, the writer Olga Slavnikova ironically writes, странный взрыв интеллектуальной и творческой активности, наблюдаемый здесь, in Sverdlovsk, Екатеринбург, в последние полтора десятилетия, Initiated by some kind of mutagenic factor, related to our So it's initiated by some kind of mutation uh, stemming from bad ecology. Uh, several major phenomena have emerged in Sverdlovsk almost simultaneously, and several dozens of very talented writers, artists, musicians, film and theater directors uh, have been living there next to one another. They were involved into a joint circle united by mutual influences, shared interests, ideas, and tastes, as well by the quest for radical cultural innovation and no less radical rejection of Soviet cultural norms and expectations. And of course, uh, in, in the following, I will very briefly uh, remind of the brightest stars of, of that process. Uh, naturally, around these bright stars, there were many, many other people, and the overall a circle of cultural actors was larger than, than um, four or five hundred people, including spectators, constant spectators, it was even larger. So, uh, of course, the, the first and most uh, famous phenomenon of uh, uh, the Sverdlovsk uh, cultural revolution was rock music. It was the most visible aspect and uh, was associated with the formation of the Sverdlovsk Rock Club opened in 1986, the second rock club in the USSR after the Leningrad one. Um, uh, rock club uh, was organizing um, annual rock festivals that uh, very promptly had become national sensation. And uh, its permanent participants included, but was not limited uh, uh, by, by such uh, Sverdlovsk-based but nationally famous groups as Nautilus Pompilius, Chaif, Agatha Christie, Nasty, Aprilsky Marsh, and some others. Many books and articles are written about the Urals rock, yet typically it is discussed outside of its local context, while in fact it was inseparable from it. And for instance, the author of text for Nautilus, Ilya Karmilsov, was a very prominent uh, literary figure, and uh, it, it was all interconnected. Contemporary art. Since 1987, Sverdlovsk witnessed a series of free, i.e. uncensored, exhibitions uh, of non-conformist art held at the former building of the Station of Free Postals, Stanza Volnich Pocht. You can see it's inside on the top uh, photograph. Uh, and later in another building, and here you can see the actual photograph of the line to, the, to this exhibition, in the, not, not at the central place of the city, as a matter of fact. Um, it's, uh, organizer of this exhibit uh, was an artist, Viktor Mahotin, in Alexei Ivanov's words, Махотин переформатировал выставку в нечто небывалое. Приходить сюда можно было в любое время дня и ночи. Привечали всех. Поэты читали здесь стихи, живописцы живописали, лекторы проводили беседы, и все желающие спорили о чем угодно, иной раз чуть не до, не до мордобоя. Uh, probably uh, the most prominent uh, artistic phenomenon and most original uh, artistic phenomenon of Sergeyev's contemporary art scene uh, were the neo-primitivist art and Skamaroch-like performances of Evgeny Malachin, uh, better known by his pseudonym Be Ukashkin and Starik Bukashkin. Uh, Bukashkin has organized around himself a group of young artists and followers titled Kartinik, with which uh, he painted city fences and garbage cans and performed perform uh, primitivist songs of their own composition in Sverdlovsk and other cities. 
Um, to the popularity of this uh, group testifies the fact that in Kartinik's performances, along with its permanent, permanent actors, participated Mike Nauminka, Janka Diagileva, Igor Letov, and many others. Bukashkin's disciple, Alexander Shaburov, since 1999 as a part of the art group Blue Noses, has also created a series of exhibitions and performances in the Ekaterinburg of 1987-1993, which brought him a reputation of one of the most inventive post-conceptualists. Having moved to Moscow and becoming a prominent figure in the worldwide contemporary art, Shaburov has dedicated his uh, show at the Moscow Biennale in 2009 to Bukashkin, and it was basically a little museum of Bukashkin there. Uh, cinema. Uh, a mediocre and provincial Sverdlovsk film studio, previously known by its quasi-epic and horrible films about the Ural's past, in the late 80s had been undergoing the process of reformatting and reinvention. First of all, it had, has become associated with films of Vladimir Khatinenko, a former graduate of the Sverdlovsk Architectural Institute, who has been working at the studio since 1978. Between 84 and 93, Khatinenko, although living predominantly in Moscow, has produced at Sverdlovsk Film Studio seven of his films, including such prominent ones as Zerkal de Giroy, a 1987 screenplay by another Sverdlovsk uh, native Nadezhda Kazushana and Makarov, 1993. Yeah. Sure. Not yet famous, Alexei Balabanov, in 1985-89, worked as an assistant of director at the Sverdlovsk Film Studio and made here his first three shorts, Ranshi Bil Drugoye Vriyame, 1987, Umiyanyi Druga, One Step Beyond, 1988, with a cameo appearance of main luminaries of the Sverdlovsk Rock Club, including Butusov, and uh, finally, his diploma for the high director's courses, Nasty Igor, about uh, two stars of the Urals rock scene, Nastya Poliva and Igor Belkin. However, most importantly, Sveros Film Studio uh, has become a center of the new documentary cinema and the site of the annual festival of documentaries titled Russia. It has also housed a new school of animation under the leadership of Alexander Petrov in 2000, he will win the Oscar for his animated film, The Old Man and the Sea. His disciples will produce famous um, animated films such as Gagarin by Alexei Kharitidi and Devochka Dura by Zoe Kireyeva. Theater. Two theaters, uh, the Theater of the Young Spectators and the Opera House, have become the centers of innovation and targets of heated debates in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, Choose under the intellectual leadership of its head of the literary department, Oleg Layevsky, brought in two young and daring directors, Dmitry Astrakhan, who lived in Ekaterinburg in 1981-87, and Anatoly Proudin, lived in 89-96. Astrakhan, who later will become one of the most uh, visible Russian film and TV directors, has earned his first fame in Sverdlovsk by the stage versions of Van Wiesen's Nedrasel and Ostrovsky's Dachodnaya Mesta. These performances were attacked by the nationalist organization Atechistva, the Ural's branch of the infamous Pamit, for a blasphemous, or rather blasphemously hilarious, interpretations of Russian classical dramas. So the Tangeza story is, is an old one indeed. Um, Proudin shined in his surrealist productions, oh, I'm sorry, uh, of Iuda uh, Iskariot, Balianid Andreev, Goria Tuma, Alice Behind the Looking Glass, by Louis Carroll, Chilevek Rossiya, and Basimov Marshak, all based on Natalia Skarahod's inventive stage versions. For Alice Proudin actually was awarded one of the last Soviet state prizes, Gos Premier of 1991. Another theatrical revolution uh, has been happening at the stage of the Sverdlovsk Opera House, where the director Alexander Titel, later the head of the Moscow Stanislavsky Musical Theater, and conductor Evgeny Kolobov, he will create the new opera in Moscow, stunned conservatives by such fresh and innovative productions as the Hoffman's Tales and new opera The Prophet about Pushkin by Vladimir Kabekin, and especially uh, Rimsky Korsakov's The Tale of Tsar Sultan, which has also enraged nationalists from Atechistva who have detected in this cheerful performance the propaganda of Zionism. <laughs> Literature, very briefly. Writers, poets, and critics were actively involved in theatrical and art endeavors. But specifically, literary innovations were associated with the so-called experimental issue of the journal Ural, 1988, number one, which became a bestseller and was sold at black markets, apparently. And later, a journal within a journal titled Text 
which has been appearing four times a year as a part of Euro in 1998 and 91. And I, I wouldn't bother you with, with a long list of uh, authors uh, participating in these projects. If one tries uh, to detect a unifying style of this new artistic and cultural phenomena, she or he would face a striking combination of contrasting polarities, hyperrealism and postmodernism, brutality and sentimentality, playful sophistication and naive art. Actually, the only common feature could be detected in the exclusion of the middle, i.e. the stylistic middle ground exemplified either by psychological realism or reader viewer oriented poetics of kitchen blockbuster. Apparent activists of the Sverdlovsk Cultural Revolution did not attempt to lead the masses towards perestroika and democratization. Rather, they sought radical experiments that would manifest profound intellectual and emotional liberation from the stale Soviet normalcy. Their goal uh, was an enthusiastic quest for new cultural languages. These new languages of a free culture, frequently imagined by them as politically non-engaged, were to be invented from the material of universally recognized, or on the contrary, avant-gardist and uh, modernist discourses, but not uh, according to regional or national traditions. Traditions were rejected by them as deeply compromised by their intertwining with Soviet discourses, and all things Soviet were negated most radically. This is why, while seemingly belonging to the original culture, this new phenomena radically problematized the very concept of the original culture. None of Sverdlov's cultural actors in the late 80s, early 90s, did exploit or attempt to invent anything resembling color local. All the works produced during this period did not present themselves as phenomena belonging to the Urals culture. Rather, they strived to develop new forms for Russia or even more ambi ambitiously global culture, as they imagined it, of course, which suggested indifference to any regional traditions or idiosyncratic features. Regionalism exemplified by Alexei Ivanov belongs to the 2000-2010s. It will arise uh, a decade after as a reaction to the cultural innovation of the prehistoric period. Uh, the philosopher Artemi Magun has defined the dominant spirit of perestroika through the comparison with the Great French Revolution by a concept of the negative revolution. According to Magun, quote, before the face of the revolution, a contemporary subject has to turn to himself. Revolution negation, seeking an absolute separation from the past, turns the society against itself as its own past, end quote. One may argue that in Sverdlov's cultural innovation, Perestroika's negative revolution found its adequate manifestation, probably most adequate. It was the Euro's rootlessness that has best of all resonated with the logic of internalized negation. It was a peculiar regional cultural identity that allowed to incorporate into the negated past the concepts of regional tradition and regional culture. However, due to the fact that the knowledge and understanding of the global culture among Sverdlov's cultural activists was inevitably fragmented and eclectic, their overall cultural production represented a very specific, if idiosyncratic or even regional, version of global tendencies such as postmodernism, hyperrealism, hyper or near avant-garde. In other words, the quest for non-regional, non-national forms and cultural languages appeared in Sverdlov's perestroika culture as the paradoxical expression of the regional or other centrifugal cultural specificity. While negating Moscow-centered culture and politics, Sverdlov's cultural revolutionaries offered their own scripts for new Russian or other new post-Soviet culture, universal, non-regional, and regional at the same time. Through the prism of Alexander Atkin's concept of internal colonization, this cultural movement can, can be interpreted as a post-colonial one wherein in, uh, the, the regional colony appropriates the center's function to formulate cultural norms for the entire, albeit uh, collapsing, empire. And I will stop here because the time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you.